So let's start with something you know terribly well, Afghanistan, uh, because it's in the news right now. And I'm not going to ask you to comment on policy, right, current policy. But for what you know of Afghanistan, let me put it as simply as I can as a layperson. How do we avoid this being Vietnam in 1975 if we pull out of there and have a total collapse of the regime? Yeah, well, you're hitting the essence of the issue, David, because frankly, we have to go back to what Secretary Pompeo recently referred to as first principles. We're sitting here, you and I, in New York City. And on 9-11, we were attacked with people who were stationed there, so to speak. Uh, that's where it was their home base. And over 3,000 people from 91 countries, innocent people, were murdered. Now, we may want the war over. We may even declare the war over. But in the military, we learn the enemy gets a vote. Here's what we have to do. Work internationally to keep building the coalition against terrorism so they have no safe haven anywhere on Earth. And when we find a country, say Iran, which uses terrorism as an instrument of, of foreign policy, as they do with Lebanese Hezbollah, then we have to make certain that the cost of doing that is high enough that they cease that behavior. The one thing we surely don't want is Al-Qaeda or some version of Al-Qaeda coming back on, in online over in Afghanistan, which is what happened, as you say, 18 years ago. Can we do that without boots on the ground? Can we do that with special forces and from the air? We cannot do that right now without boots on the ground. But the whole point is to keep helping other countries strengthen their internal controls, their internal processes, uh, improve their education system, their economic system, so the root causes disappear. But the bottom line is we're going to have to stay together as an international community. We're going to have to do this, and we're going to have to stick with those countries that are not yet ready to do it on their own and keep enough boots on the ground probably the number dropping year by year as they mature, but enough boots on the ground not to simply turn the ground back over to the very enemy that, uh, that attacked us before. As I said, you spent over four decades protecting this country in the Marine Corps. Uh, you, you know national security terribly well. And I've heard you say one of the biggest threats to us actually is our debt and our deficit, how much money we're spending, how far we're going to hock, essentially. At the same time, we're spending a lot of money in the military. How do you reconcile those two things? As I understand, there's something like 83 projects of money to $2 trillion working the way through the pipeline right now. Right. Uh, is that really consistent with the national interest in the long term? Well, the first point I would make is uh, we can afford survival of, of our experiment that you and I call America. And that's all it is, a great big experiment. Uh, a government of the people, by the people, for the people is seen as a threat by authoritarians. Right now, we're spending a little bit over 3.1 percent of GDP on our military. We can afford to do even more than that if it comes down to our survival. No matter how much it costs, it's a lot cheaper than stumbling into a war because an adversary thinks we're weak. So what we do, again, we have to align ourselves with allies so we're not carrying the full burden for this, NATO being foremost there. We have other allies around the world. And just recognize this is a reality. We're going to have to adjust to it. I just finished a book uh, titled Appeasement about how did we stumble into World War II. And Winston Churchill asked partway through the war, what would we call World War II, what you and I call World War II? It wasn't named that yet. We called the Great War or World War I the Great War. And he said we should call World War II the unnecessary war. Had the democracies stepped forward, uh, enhanced their defenses, worked together, we could have stopped the fascists much sooner. Uh, it's critical if we want to maintain the peace that we do this. I've never seen peace strengthened through weakness. Uh, it's one thing to talk about how much we spend. Mm -hmm. It's another how we're spending it, where we're spending yeah. it. How do we make Indeed. sure that those dollars are actually going for things we need? Because it, it's possible we should be spending more money other places, even in the military, than where we're spending it now. Uh, it's, uh, that's exactly the kind of discussion we have to have. Uh, but I would tell you the first step is to figure out what it is the Western democracies, and in this case ours, Americas, what, what they stand for and what they won't stand for. Then look at the threats, assess them, and come up with a strategy that keeps us out of war, aligned with our like-minded nations, other democratic nations. And in that regard, you put a strategy together that recognizes reality. And all strategy is, David, is setting priorities. And then you set the priorities for what you're going to do. Uh, but I, again, I would say America can afford survival. So we can do this, especially if we do it in league with other nations. Uh, two lessons I took in leadership from your book. One is intention of the commander. Express yes. your intention and then let the troops try to figure out how to do it, respond in right. real time to issues. Another is speed, tempo, move, go forward. Uh, 
when can that get in our way? I mean, we talk about business here a lot. CEOs maybe act fast. Sometimes right. you can act too fast. Even in the Iraq War, you went past an ambush, and you, you know, and it went past it, yeah. and that and that quarry. And and you were on the board of Theranos, and you wanted to try to get something fast into the field to help people. How does a commander or a leader, a business leader, yeah. know how fast to act and when to slow down? I think the first uh, point I would make is you have to analyze risk. And you have to quantify it to the degree you can. Business people, I find, as a, as a group, are probably some of the best at this. Quantify the risk and then determine what element of your corporate effort, your war fighting machine, is going to take that risk and for how long. And once you've done that, you know should you employ strategic patience and delay things because you don't have the information. But I would also point out that when you're in a time competitive environment, I don't care if it's a football game or a market opportunity opening and closing rapidly or an opportunity on the battlefield that the frontline troop is going to see and it's going to take forever to get that word back to headquarters, the more the leader can set the vision and set the tempo and then take his hands off the steering wheel and let the subordinates he's trained and selected and now trust to make their own calls, then you're probably going to make better calls most of the time. Not always, and then you just have to adapt, improvise, and overcome. What keeps you up at night, if anything, when it comes to national security? Uh, it's mostly how we treat one another as Americans. Uh, are we listening to one another? You know, George Washington had a way of leading a revolutionary army. He called it, you listen, you learn, you help, and then you lead. And I would just point out that today in America, I don't think we're listening to one another enough. I, I think that we at times uh, deny the reality that perhaps our, uh, the person we disagree with might actually be right once in a while. And we're going to have to make this work if we're going to keep this democracy alive. We're going to have to listen and work with each other. So going to that point, I believe, let me quote from something you say in your book. You say, I believe that I and all Americans need to recognize that our democracy is an experiment, something you just referred to, and one that can be reversed. We all know that we're better than our current politics. Tribalism need not disrupt our experiment. You come from an environment, the Marines, where tribalism is anathema. You're always looking out for the guy next to you. Uh, the woman next to you. Uh, we don't always have that in Washington. We don't always have that in our society. Mm -hmm. How did you learn that? How did you train your Marines in that? And what could we do? Now that you've had experience in Washington as Secretary of Defense, what could we do to return some of that concern for the fellow mm -hmm. American, the person on our right, the person on our left? I think, first of all, we have to get back to a fundamental friendliness, a fundamental respect for each other as fellow Americans. If we have different visions of where we want to go, then let's sit down and talk about it. Let's not go off into our own communities and just get into echo chambers reinforcing our view. We were set up to require compromise to make our government work. It's not a dirty word. But I think what we really need to look at is that what are we turning over to our children? World War II veterans come home and say, what a crummy world. Uh, hundreds of thousands of their buddies are dead. Uh, we've been in through a terrible war. And what do they do? They say we're part of that world, whether we like it or not and they put up the United Nations in imperfect place to talk about things, maybe we need to be a little more united as a nation and be our own ally and start talking with one another and respecting one another and figuring out where we have common ground and talk about that as much as we talk about where we don't have common ground. 